Uh, hi, my name's Nathan Harvey. Uh, I like to put pictures of myself on slides so that when you're looking at me and then get bored of looking at me, you can look at me and know what I look like, and that makes me feel good. Uh, I'm the community director at Chef, which is a company. I'm the co-host of the Food Fight Show podcast. If you've not listened to it and enjoy the next 45 minutes listening to my voice, you should totally subscribe. Uh, the Food Fight Show is a podcast where DevOps chefs do battle. So we talk a lot about DevOps. We talk a lot about Chef. Uh, we're going to do an episode next week where we're uh, not really going to talk much about Chef. We're going to talk about this new thing called console templates. Uh, and if you've heard of those, like, oh, I want to tune in on Wednesday, because that's when it's going to be, next Wednesday. And if not, like, maybe you should anyhow. I am an occasional farmer. If you go to that URL there, bit.ly slash farmer dash Nathan, you'll find out what I mean when I say I'm an occasional farmer. You have to misspell my name if you want to get to the right video. I don't know what happens if you spell my name correctly. but. Uh, the rule in my house was mom picks the names, dad misspells them. So he did that for me and all of my siblings. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. I keep my phone's ringer on. So if you tweet me while I'm giving a presentation, my phone will buzz. I do that because it used to be that I was on call um, and my phone would interrupt me from important matters all the time. And so I've grown accustomed to it annoying or, or an, ignoring the text messages that come through. So you can tweet at me. My phone will buzz. Everyone in the room will know that some dude was trying to troll me. But I'm such a professional, I will ignore it and move on. We'll see what happens if that's the case or not. Um, so I want to ask, I want to do some science, because I love it when presenters do science, and I know you do too. And by science, I mean I'm going to ask you to raise your hand a couple of times, because that's real science. So uh, are you a system administrator? If you are, raise your hand. The uh, truth of the matter is you can answer yes to more than one. You have as many votes as you want for these questions. Are you a developer? Raise your hand. All right, lots of developers. That's cool. Are you a Ruby developer? Shit. See, the, the problem is sometimes I'm going to show some Ruby code, and then there are Ruby developers in the room who are going to be like, that's bad code. But the rest of you will be like, it looks like some Ruby. That's cool. So I prefer the Ruby developers. When I show the bad code, just make with the quiet. It's cool. How many of you are DevOps? Awesome. So you can't be a DevOps, but we can talk about that over lunch, too. But it's cool. I, I love you anyhow, Maybe because maybe you can be a DevOps. How many of you are business people? OK, this is like the question that I asked about humans earlier. You're all business people. You might not realize it, but you are. It's true. Um, any experience with infrastructure as code or configuration management of any type? I kind of already asked this one in the preamble, but more people came in, so I have to ask it again so that my uh, sample set is you know, valid as I'm doing this science. And how many have experience with Chef? Good, good, good. Again, if I lie about Chef and you have experience with Chef, like just keep that, mum's the word. We're good. Uh, so uh, this is a very important question, because this will tell me that like all that stuff was interesting. This will tell me really about you. I want to know which version control system you use. Which version control? Who uses this version control system? <laughs> All right. You know, you could do better. You could do better. But this version control system is still not complete, because everyone in this room knows that every proper version control system has a very important command, and that is blame. So now I have given you a full-fledged version control system. You can blame now also. Uh, if you use either of these three version control systems, the thing that you should not care about is infrastructure as code. The thing that you should care about is how do you do source code control and source code management. So if these are the things that you're like, yeah, that's the one I use, you should leave and go to like learngit.com or whatever the learning place is to learn about Git. Uh, so which version control systems? I heard a couple people shout out. Git. Git. What else do you use? SVN, SVN's cool. Do you use Git SVN though? Because that's the only way to use SVN. CVS, uh, all right, that's cool. Like, I, I don't have a, I don't have a funny comeback about Git in CVS. Um, anyone use Perforce? That's cool too. You can use Git Fusion with Perforce. That's fun. Uh, there goes some tweets. See, I told you I would ignore them. Let's talk about infrastructure as code. And I want to talk about the sysadmin's journey. Uh, and by the sysadmin, uh, I mean the everyman sysadmin. And by the everyman sysadmin, I mean me. Like, this is how I became a sysadmin. Um, the fact of the matter is I was hired at a startup to be a director of customer support. And the, the best thing about this startup was it was a stealth startup, which meant we had no product yet, which meant we had no customers yet, 
which means I was the director of customer support. Nobody bothered me. It was awesome. It was the best <laughs> job ever. Like, how many of you have ever done customer support of any kind, right? And what happens in that job? People call you on the phone, right? We didn't have any customers. Nobody could call me. I was living high for about two days. But two days after I started, the CEO came into my office and said, hey, those Russian developers that got us funding, because we were venture-backed, so I like, knew I would get a paycheck. That was cool. That allowed us to hire a director of customer support. Uh, we hate them. We fired them. You're now the most technical guy on staff. But don't worry. Don't worry. It's cool. We've hired in a firm to take the prototype and turn it into a real application. But we're going to go live in six weeks, build us a production infrastructure. Go. So that day, I became a sysadmin. And I've, I've been a proud sysadmin ever since. And so that day, I learned uh, about SSH. That's not true. I knew about SSH before. Let's not, let's, let's not lie too much. So I, I, I said, all right, I need to build a box where I can put this thing. So I SSH into the box, and I started banging around. And, and like I deployed our application there, and I felt pretty good. But then I had to do it again. And I thought, oh, shoot. What did I do? And it took a long time. So this time, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to store my notes into server.txt. So every time I write a command, I'm going to just copy and paste it into there. But then that box died, and I lost the disk, and so I lost all my notes. So that sucks. So the third box, I was like, all right, now I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the notes, and I'm going to put them into a wiki. And so here was the thing, right? I'd log into a box, and I'd type in a command. And I would be really, really nervous before I hit that magic key, because I, I didn't really know what was going to happen and like, what was going to break. And everyone knows what the magic key is, right? It's enter or return or whatever, right? Like It makes the things happen. So I was really nervous about that magic key. So the thing that I would do is I would copy that command, and I would paste it into the wiki. And then when I, when I hit paste and I hit save, I, I felt so I, I, it was like being wrapped in a blanket of warmth. Like I felt like I can do this again. It's lovely. And then I hit enter, and then the thing happened. The thing that I didn't realize, like when I came back later, I got despondent because the wiki was now a lie. Because the thing that happens is once you change something on a system by hand, you go back and you change things on systems again by hand. And what you don't do ever is update the docs, because who loves updating the docs? Yeah, right. No one in here. You guys are answering all my questions super well. That's awesome. So then I started writing some scripts. I wrote scripts like setup.sh and fixit.sh and fixitagain.sh. And I put, them, I put them all in version control systems. You know, I used one of the three. Like, that was also like, my journey of version control, was those uh, slides from before. And then I got to like, oh, well, I built up this thing. Now I can just take a snapshot of it. I've got a golden image. It's beautiful. That's what I'll use. Because now when I need another, I can just say, oh, we'll take this image and just give me another one. And I can start blowing up all of my infrastructure like this. And it'll be super easy and awesome. But actually, that totally failed me also. And maybe it's failing you right now. Um, and I'll talk about why. And then I found this thing called policy-driven configuration management. Um, and that's the thing that saved me as a sysadmin. And when I, when I finally got to that stage, I could say, I am now a professional sysadmin. And then I quit my job and went and became a director of community. Uh, but th it's cool. Like, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the benefits of automation. And really, automation is where we want to get to. Automation is great because it allows us to move quickly. It allows us to scale, and it get, provides consistency for us. Now, when we talk about scale, how many of you are Facebook scale size infrastructure that you manage? Right. Not even the dude at Facebook manages a Facebook size uh, infrastructure. But really, scale isn't just about the number of servers. There are a bunch of dimensions to scale when you think about managing your infrastructure. It's not only the number of servers. It's also the number of people on your team. If you're a team of just one, and that day when I became a sysadmin, I was a team of one. So everything I did was, was something that I could repeat, because I did it. I had the muscle memory. I remembered it. But as soon as we added another person to the team and started to scale out that team, it became a problem. Uh, it's also the complexity of your applications or of your infrastructure. So we talk, there's a, there was a talk earlier about Docker. And every container should have one process per container. And like as we started to pull on that thread a little bit, like the light bulb started going off in the room like, wow, that becomes a really complex infrastructure very quickly because to, to have one process per container to run my applications, how many processes, how many of your applications are one process? Right, none, right? Uh, that dude in the back, he has one, a one process application. Do you know what, because he's a sysadmin, and do you know what process that is? It's tail minus F. That's your one process, <laughs> isn't it? Boom. So 
Awesome. So we have many, many dimensions of scale. So we really need an automation platform that can do a bunch of things for us. Uh, it can provide uh, and, and present a dependable view of my infrastructure. So what is the current state of my infrastructure? What does my infrastructure look like right now? It needs to be able to handle complex dependencies between your nodes or between the parts of your infrastructure. So think, for example, uh, and by complex, I mean simple in this particular case. Like think about a load balancer. Which machines should a load balancer direct traffic to? Your automation platform should be able to answer that question for you. Has to be fault tolerant and secure. Also in the Docker talk, there was a dude up here, I don't know if he's still here, who said, yeah, because security is not my concern. He's, he made a point of saying that like seven times. I think he works at the NSA, um, but security was not his concern, clearly. Uh, and if you're here, like, it's cool. Security doesn't have to be your concern. The automation platform should manage cloud resources and provide a great foundation for innovation. How many of you deploy to a cloud of some sort, whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud? How many of you de uh, deploy to uh, physical hardware, like bare metal in a data center? You know, this thought just occurred to me. Um, a long time ago in my career, I, I was responsible for managing an extranet. How many of you have heard of an extranet before, <laughs> right? Like, those things don't exist anymore, do they? Like, they still do. It's just a website with a login, right? So I wonder, I wonder when we'll be at a point where the question of do you manage shit in the cloud or in a physical data center becomes as ridiculous. Um, that thought literally just occurred to me, but so maybe. So infrastructure as code, what does that mean? What does it even mean? So when we talk about infrastructure as code, what, what I mean, and I have some specific things that are on the slide and that I like to talk about. What I mean is that you can programmatically provision and configure the components within your infrastructure. So you can go from nothing to a fully blown up infrastructure. And by blown up, I mean it's like inflatable. I don't mean like, there's my infrastructure, now I blew it up. <laughs> oh, that's bad, right? So you can go from nothing to I put, some, I put some automation in it, and now I have an infrastructure. That's awesome. And I can configure all the components within that infrastructure. Here's, here's an audience participation part of uh, this slide deck. Uh, infrastructure as code, I can treat it like any other code base. What do you think it means when I say treat it like any other code base? What, what do you do with some of your other code bases? Version control. You put it in version control. What else? You test it. Yeah, you have to test it. What else? Continuous integrations, right? So I want to, not only do I want to write tests for it, but I want to run those tests continually. And, and if I'm in version control, maybe I have multiple branches, I want to continually integrate those branches together and so forth. Absolutely. The other thing um, that you do with code, and, and the reason that you do this, and, and it's part of the reason that you do testing and continuous integration, is you refactor your code, right? Most of you are developers in here. How many of you wrote some code and looked at that same code two years later and said, that code is still the best code ever? <laughs> All right, that dude in the back also, <laughs> right? Like there's always the one dude or one lady. Sometimes it is a lady and that's cool, um, but like, uh, yeah, you, when you write code, I like to think of code as a continual experiment. Con code is always changing. And so our infrastructure code is going to be the same thing, right? Sometimes sysadmins, they just want to take a thing off of a shelf and put it in and never touch that thing again. It's not really a feasible way. That is a failure. You're going to change that. It's going to change over time. With treating your infrastructure as code, you can reconstruct the entirety of your business and by the entirety of your business, what I mean is all of your business applications with three things, your code repository, a backup of your data, and your compute resources, right? So there was a time in my history where I woke up one morning and I realized that the next change to my production infrastructure was going to start with a commit to my GitHub repository or a Git repository somewhere. And it was so freeing and cha it changed the entire approach that I had to, uh, to doing system administration and to managing my infrastructure. When we think about uh, infrastructure as code like this, think about it in terms of disaster recovery. If I need to take my systems and move them from US East because there's a hurricane coming over to US West, like I have all the code and the data, I can do that. I can make that happen. Uh, it's super powerful. <clears throat> so these are the things that you can do with infrastructure as code. Uh, I'm not going to repeat them or read the slide to you. I hope that's okay. You might be reading the slides already because I gave you the GitHub URL. So when we talk about policy-based configuration management or policy-based infrastructure as code, 
what you're going to do is capture the policy for your infrastructure in code. And what does that mean? Your policy is basically the desired state or description of what you want your infrastructure to look like. You will have a program that ensures the, node in, the nodes in your infrastructure are following the policy. And that program will run continuously. So for example, if we were to use Chef, no, let's not use Chef. Let's use Puppet. So I have a Puppet agent, and the Puppet agent runs on the node, and it looks at policy, and it says, does this node comply to the policy? Is it configured properly right now? If not, I'm going to fix that. And then 30 minutes later, the Puppet agent runs again, and it says, is this node still in, sh in good shape? If not, I'm going to fix it. And this allows for your policy to change over time, and it prevents your infrastructure from drifting. Well, like I like to call it configuration drift. Like Things change on systems. We want to keep them in line with our policy. So if we have a sample infrastructure that looks something like this, it doesn't really matter if this is your infrastructure or not. There's a bunch of things here. Let's, let's go back to like golden images kind of work. I can, I can build all of this with golden images. I can have a golden image for Graphite, for Nagios, for my Postgres masters, and so forth. And then when I need another, I can just launch a new instance of that type. But what happens when you have a new compliance mandate? So at this uh, you know, company here, they did a thing that uh, that dude up front from the previous talk never wanted to do. They had a security audit. And the security auditors came in, and they looked around the infrastructure, and they said, hey, you know what? SSH is listening on port 22. That's the default port. That's not safe. We need to secure this infrastructure. So we're going to move SSH and have it listen on a different port. That's how we'll secure this infrastructure. How many of you have been through a security audit like that? Yeah, security theater is awesome. Um, but it, nevertheless, like that's our policy. So I have to move SSH off of port 22 onto port 2022. Uh, super easy, right? What do you, how many files do I have to change in order to do that? I have to change one file. In fact, I have to change one line in one file. Uh, but crap, I'm using golden images. So now I need to rebuild six different golden images to make this one change, this one line change. And after I've rebuilt these six golden images, I then need to launch and provision new instances of these images, which means I need to de launch, delete, because you shouldn't reverse that order. I learned that early on also. <laughs> launch, delete, repeat. And you're typically going to do that manually. And you've got a dozen boxes to do, and like, what's going to happen there? Oh, and I'm in the cloud. And as it turned out, when I launched a new one, it got a different IP address. Uh, and so now all of my configuration, which things talk to which things, is completely borked up. And that's not OK. Um, and also, I'm doing 12 things. Uh, I should do this in a maintenance window. I don't want to bring down my site so that I could change the port that SSH listens on. So that could be ugly. Again, with new IP addresses, like now things just got super more complex, not fun. So we need a way to solve all of this. There are many ways to solve all of this. The one that we're going to talk about for the rest of our time together is Chef. Um, so Chef is a platform, it's a framework that provides for flat, fast, scalable, flexible IT automation. Chef is actually a couple of things. So Chef is an open source framework for managing the complexities across your infrastructure. Uh, and when I say open source, I mean it is fully open source. Every bit of our code that we write, that we sell to you, we also give to you as open source. Uh, Chef is also a community of professionals. So there are tons of people that are using Chef or that have heard the word Chef. Welcome to our community. You're now part of the Chef community because you came to a Chef talk. Uh, and then Chef is also a company. So there's this company that I work for that pays me every two weeks, well, twice a month. Uh, and it's awesome. Uh, so. Here's Chef. Uh, here's a high-level overview of Chef. So there are a bunch of components to it. There's a Chef server, where we store all of our policy. You have the Chef clients, which run on the nodes within your infrastructure. So a node is uh, a server uh, that's either on physical hardware, off in the cloud somewhere, what have you. And then there's a bunch of other pieces of Chef. We're not going to talk about all of these. What I want to do is just give you a little taste of how Chef works here. So the Chef server itself, I want to dig into that. The Chef server provides policy and state for you. It gives you a view of the state of your infrastructure, and it's a place where you can store and publish all of the policies for what your infrastructure should do. So let's just talk about the, the um, policies first. So how does Chef actually work? So you have a node or some server somewhere, um, and it runs the Chef client. And it, the Chef client will ask the Chef server, what policy should I follow? And the Chef 
server has a bunch of policies on it. Like here's the policy that it means to be a MySQL server. Here's what it means to be an Apache server. Here's what it means uh, to manage users and so forth. Well, the Chef server will take the subset of those policies that the node should follow, and it will send those policies down to the node. And so this particular node has a recipe called NTP client. So it should be an NTP client, because uh, of course we're like we all use version control and we all synchronize our clocks, right? Because we're professionals. So NTP client, uh, it should manage users and it should be a web server. So these policies come down onto the Chef client, and the Chef client will inspect those policies and make sure that that node is following that policy. Now, the server did very little work in that interaction. The node said, hey, I'm node. My name is Foo. It said, here's your policy. Make sure you're following that policy. And all of that work then gets pushed out to the Chef client on the node. So let's, uh, all right, so that's policy. Are there questions about that before I move on to state? And then I'm going to do code. All right, you're like, get to the code, right? All right, so what about the state of your infrastructure? Because the Chef server also stores that. As these nodes execute their policy, they're also going to save data about themselves back to the Chef server. So let's think about that um, load balancer configuration problem that we had. I want to write a policy for my HA proxy that says, hey, you should pass load back to these web servers that sit behind you. The thing I don't know when I'm writing my policy is what are going to be the host names for those web servers? How many web servers are there going to be? I have no idea what these answers are as I'm writing down my policy. I just write the policy. And then what happens when the chef client runs on the HA proxy node, it will ask the chef server, hey, who are the web servers that I should be passing load off to? And the web server has a view, a searchable index of information about your infrastructure. So the chef server knows there are 500 nodes in this environment. 200 of them are web servers. So it will pull back a list of web servers and send that back to the HA proxy server. And as it, as it configures itself, it will direct load to each one of those load balancers. So it will write out its HA proxy config. If you've never used HA proxy, it doesn't matter. Like conceptually, it says, hey, you should talk to these guys back here. So the Chef server has that view uh, of your infrastructure and makes it completely searchable for the nodes within your infrastructure. So I end up like this. And now, if I add another web server to my infrastructure, the next time Chef Client runs on the HA proxy node, it will automatically see that and start passing loads to it. And likewise, if I pull a node off of my Chef server or pull a node out of my infrastructure, the HA proxy server can stop sending load back to that node. What questions can I answer for you on that? Does that seem like something that might be useful to you? Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about building your policy. So I've talked, I've said, thrown this word out, policy, policy, policy. Let's talk about how do we build the policy within Chef. So policy starts with these low-level building blocks that in Chef terms we call resources. So a resource is a thing on your system and its desired state. So that thing on your system is something that you can manipulate. It might be a package that should be installed, uh, a database that should be running, a backup file that should be loaded into the database, something like this. You can find out all kinds of information about the resources that we have in our docs page. Uh, let's do some code. <clears throat> So I'm going to um, come over here, and I'm going to make this as big as I can. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and that. All right. Ooh. So here's how, um, here's how our resources work. So my policy says uh, I should have a file in temp that should say, hello, chef. It's a pretty uh, you know, common policy. Probably all of your infrastructures have this same policy. So the way that I, of course, that's a lie, right? That, you could laugh at that. It's cool. Like, that was a joke. But so um, the way that I do this is in my chef code, this is a policy file that I'm writing, except we don't call it a policy file because that's kind of boring. Uh, we call it a recipe because we're chefs, and so we, we write recipes. So I'm going to put into this recipe a resource. Um, some would argue that we should have called them ingredients, but we didn't. We called them resources. So I'm going to put a resource into this recipe. It's going to be a file resource. And each, uh, each resource is going to have a type, so it's a file. 
and then it's going to have a name, and that name is usually meaningful. And for a file resource, the name is going to be the name of the file that I'm going to manage here with Chef. So I'm going to put a file at var, uh, no, I'm not going to put it at var, I'm going to put it at temp, and I'm going to call it hello chef. Uh, I'll put a .txt on it, because why not? And then I'm just going to type in the words do and end. Um, and of course, I type them both together, and then, I, and then I go back in the middle, because I always forget my end, and it's not good to forget your end. Uh, and then I'm going to do some other things. So it's a, a resource is a thing, and it's desired state. So it's desired state, in this case, is going to, uh, a file is going to have some content. And I'm also going to give it a mode. And I'm going to just give it 0777. What's the mode for? The permissions on the file, right? Who wants to spend the next 20 minutes talking about Linux file permissions? Excellent. Good, good, good. That was the answer I was hoping you were going to give me. So uh, this, if I were to read this code in English, it says there should be a file at temp hello chef text, and within that file there should be the content hello chef, and it should have permissions on that file of 777. All right, so now here's how chef works to make that happen. First, just to make sure there's nothing up my sleeve, like we'll do an ls temp uh, hello, there's nothing there. Uh, it's, it doesn't exist, right? So now I'm just going to run sudo chef apply uh, hello chef.rb. And let's see what happens here. So what's going to happen is, uh, well, let me talk about chef apply also. Chef apply is not the tool that you will use in production. Chef apply is a little utility that we can use to help demonstrate what some resources do. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. So, so here's what's happened. Uh, chef has gone in and inspected our policy, this hello chef.rb. And it says, oh, I need to create a file at hellochef.txt. Uh, update the content in that file and in the output here, which is harder to read if I don't highlight it. It added a line called hello chef. And then finally, it changed the mode from nothing to 777. And it restored the SE Linux security context. So boom. Now if I come over here and I can uh, less. Sure enough, it says hello, chef. Pretty cool. Uh, how many of you think that was easier than writing an echo statement to write out a file? <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, so let's do that instead. What if we did, uh, because I don't want to say hello to chef, because we're at ATO. Let's just do this. Uh, right, and it's also good to like know how to escape your things. Up arrows are good as well. See, this is the best part because you get to watch me type. How many of you came to watch me type? At, that's awesome. There's at least two of you. Instead of escaping the thing properly, I'm just going to remove that thing. So I now just wrote that file again, right? What happens when I less that file? It says, hello, ATO. That's cool. But is that my policy? That's not what my policy says, right? So if I sudo chef apply again, here's what's going to happen. Who knows what's going to happen? Spoiler alert. Who could spoil it before chef finishes? What's it going to do? Go, just sit. Oh, it's too late. It's already told you. You weren't fast enough. Also, don't raise your hand. Just be rude. Shout shit out. It's cool. I cuss. You can shout, shout shit out. It's fine. So what we can see here is that it fixed it. It fixed our policy. So here's the thing. Once I, start, once I start managing resources with Chef, I always manage those resources with Chef. Because um, Chef will be running on a regular basis. You'll configure the Chef client to run maybe every 30 minutes. And it's going to come through and make sure that that resource is following the policy that I've specified. Yes? Yeah. Sure. Never been rebooted. Right. Um, and I might need to make sure it's got a few changes in it and only those changes. Yes. Else sure. Is it easy enough to do a partial management of those? Absolutely. So let me uh, just restate your question because you in the back, you didn't hear that question, did you? No. Somebody shook their head no. Everyone else is like, 
email time. Uh, so the question was, here was, here was the question. Like, I have this server. It's been around for 20 years. It hasn't been rebooted ever. I want to manage it with Chef, but just a little bit, not all of it. First, when we're done, I want to give you a hug. And we all should, because that dude's been running a server for 20 years, and he hasn't <laughs> rebooted it. That's not something to be proud of. That is not something to be proud of. That is scary. That's frightening. OK, so Chef will manage all of the resources that you tell it to manage. Uh, so what you will do is it's got some old package that you want to make sure the configuration never gets touched on. Don't manage that package or its configuration with Chef. Manage your other stuff with Chef. You have users that you want to make sure are on that machine. Manage those with Chef. You're like, dude, I manage my users with LDAP. Good, keep doing that. Then manage your LDAP config with Chef. Does that um, kind of answer your question? Oh, you want to manage some of the config files. Yes. You have a database config file, yep. Sure. Ah, so what you so the question there was, I have a configuration file. This is not what your question is, but I'm going to restate it, and you're going to say, yeah, that's kind of what I was asking. I have a configuration file. It has a 1,000 different parameters in it. I want to change two and make sure I don't touch any of the others. That was your question, wasn't it? I asked it better, didn't I? <laughs> I, I have a very low opinion of myself. I don't know if you caught that yet. Um, yeah, you can totally do that with Chef. So there's a couple of ways that you can do it. And we could rat hole down that thing, or we could talk offline afterwards. Who wants us to talk offline, offline afterwards? Yeah, me too. It's cool. <clears throat> All right, so look what happened, though, while I was speaking, uh, or before I started. I reran Chef Apply against this hello chef.rb. And what Chef did this time was it ran and it said, oh, this thing is still following the policy. So I'm going to leave it alone. So now I can run this Chef Apply continually over and over and over again. And I will not change the state of the system because it is following my policy. It tells me so. It says it's up to date. How are we doing on time? That's always, oh, I have 12 minutes. I have slides that do all the stuff that I did in code, like, uh, which I could have typed less and just shown you slides. But it's more fun to type, always. So resources describe the desired state. You do not need to tell Chef how to get there. I didn't tell it how to put content into that file. If it was a package, I wouldn't tell it which package manager to use to install that package. Chef knows how to figure that out. Um, so th the resources are a piece of the system and its desired state. I could change it. Chef will fix it. Chef resources work in a test and repair model. Sometimes we use bigger math words to describe that process. If you know those math words, you should not use them. I don't like using them, so I'm not going to say them. And if you want to know why, just ask me afterwards. I'll tell you why they're bullshit. Uh, so we use test and repair. If it's following the policy, we do nothing. If it's not following the policy, we fix that resource to bring it in line with policy. But of course, you're not going to manage your infrastructure one resource at a time. You want to manage things like my database, my users, my um, applications, and so forth. Uh, there are a bunch of built-in resources, uh, policy. So when, when it gets to managing more than one thing, we start talking about recipes. And so recipes are a collection of resources. So that hello chef.rb is actually a recipe. Uh, that had just one resource in it. But of course, you can put multiple resources into one recipe. So I want to just walk you through this code really quick. This is a recipe that will set up a, a very simple web server for us. So it says here that the package HTTPD should be installed. Uh, it should have a configuration file. The service HTTPD should be started and should be enabled. And I should have a home page that says something like, hello, ATL. Uh, that sits here at this uh, thing. So as it turns out, I already have a recipe that does this. And it's ready to go. And it works. And I could probably even show you uh, that it does work because uh, because I'm kind of good about getting set up before we come into the thing. Oh, that didn't work so well, did it? Uh, yeah. Oh, 
I have a plan. All right, so here in my browser, I've just pulled up this page and look, it says hello ATO. But I did that over here in a little recipe that I have. So I have this recipe here in Cookbooks Apache. And look, it looks just like that recipe that we saw on the slide, right? It has a package, it has a template, it has a service, and it has a file. Well, what happens if I say, much like my SSH example earlier, I have a policy change. I no longer want Apache listening on port 80. I want Apache listening on port 81 now. So let's walk through how might I make that change within Chef to switch that up. But the thing is, like, I've also grown up. No longer do I just go into production and make changes and see what happens. I want a way to test out my changes before I actually implement them in my production systems. And so with Chef, we have a way to do that. Uh, there's a tool that we have called Kitchen. Kitchen is, uh, actually it's called Test Kitchen, is this tool. And what Test Kitchen allows you to do is take your cookbooks, your policies, spin up a test playground for you, put your policies into that test playground, and execute them. And then you can also test that they worked the way you expected them to. So within this cookbook, you can see here that I have a test directory. And within that, there's a, a file called uh, default underscore spec. So this is a server spec. How many of you have heard of server spec? Cool, like one person in the room. Serverspec.org, you should check it out. It's a cool way for you to write uh, tests against your infrastructure. And I bet, without me telling you any Ruby, you can figure out what these things here are testing. But what I want to do is come down to the bottom of this file, and you'll see that the last two tests say that uh, Apache is listening on port 80 and that it displays our home page. Well, I've just said that my policy has changed, so I don't want Apache listening on port 80 anymore. I want Apache listening on port 81. So the first thing that I do before I actually make any changes to my code is I'm going to update my tests. So I'm going to change this. I expect port 81 to be listening, and I expect when I curl on port 81, I'll get my home page back. So I've updated my test. Now I can use kitchen to verify. So I'm going to use kitchen verify that this node, um, it always helps to spell the commands that you want to type correctly, just by the way. So this failed because I didn't kitchen verify properly. I misspelled Apache where in my test? Oh, that probably doesn't matter. <laughs> like, why would that matter? Where did I misspell it? In the it line? In the describe? Oh, in the describe line, that does it. Like, the describe line is for me to read, and it's for you to read. So, so here's what happens. Um, test Kitchen is going to take that test file and that uh, thing that we just converged. It's going to take that test file and put it into this little VM that I have running locally. That's not a VM. It's a container. You saw it was Docker. So there's a little Docker container there. It's going to install server spec for me within that container, and then it's going to execute my tests. And do we expect these tests to pass or fail? I expect them to fail. And if the demo gods are good to me, the tests will fail. And in fact, they did. So I can scroll back up here, and I can see that I misspelled Apache. And there, there it is, misspelled, and it's cool. We all know that I meant Apache. Uh, and it has passed some tests. The package is installed and the service is running, but it's not listening on the right port, and our home page isn't working. As it turns out, our home page isn't working because we're hitting port 81. So we need to fix that. So now I can go into my recipe code. Uh, so I'm in uh, here. I'll go into the recipes default. Um, and what I'm going to do here, uh, so where does that, how, do, how does Apache know which port to listen on? Who knows? It has a listen directive in the httpd.conf. 
So I want to change how that works. Now there are about 800 different ways I could change how that works in Chef. I'm going to keep it simple for you today. Uh, I'm going to create a new variable here within my recipe, and I'm just going to call it my port. And I'm going to set it to a value of 81. Okay, That's Ruby. Is anyone confused by that bit of Ruby that I just wrote? Awesome. Now when you leave, the next talk you go to, when they ask, are you Ruby developers, you can be like, yes. <laughs> I am a Ruby developer, because I, I can read that. That's cool. All right, the other thing I'm going to do um, is not important, but is going to be helpful. Uh, I just added some new lines at the end of the file, but I did that only so that I could move the text up higher so that the people in the back can see. Uh, so now in my template, so I have this my port specified. I'm going to specify some variables. And I'm going to call this variable port. And I'm going to set the port, the value for that, to my underscore port. So in my policy, I'm telling the template that it should use a variable called port. And it should have a value of whatever the value of my port is. Now, as I said, my port, that value could come from anywhere. Uh, I kept it very simple. I hard coded it into my policy. So I'm going to write that out. And then I'm actually going to update my template. So I have this, uh, I'm looking for the listen directive, right? So everyone sees here, this is just an Apache configuration. It says, what port should I listen on? It says it's currently listening on port 80. Well, I don't want it to listen on port 80. I want it to listen to my port, the variable value that I passed down there. So in order to do that, this is an ERB template, which stands for Embedded Ruby. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little thing that says, hey, I'm about to drop a Ruby variable here. And I'm going to call that Ruby variable port. And you're like, no, you're not. You're going to call it at port. And that's cool. I'm just going to call it port. And then I'm going to write and quit that. So now I've updated my policy. So I said the my port should be 81. In the template, you should use my port to listen on. The thing that I need to do next is tell Kitchen to converge or to reapply this new policy. So I'm going to do kitchen converge. What kitchen converge will do is take my recipe, my cookbook, upload it into that Docker container, and then run the chef client. So apply that policy to this node. And if all goes well, we should see that two resources get changed. First, we're going to change the configuration file uh, of that thing. and then we're also going to restart the service HTTPD. Because one of the things that you might have seen in my policy here in the template, I have this notifies line. Do you see that notifies line there? And what that notifies line says is if the contents of that file change, then Chef should tell the service HTTPD that it should restart. If the contents of that file do not change, HTTPD will not be restarted. It'll leave it alone. So now, as a final step, I can run kitchen verify. And this, again, is going to take my tests, upload those up into that container, and execute through those tests. And if all goes well, this will pass. There will still continue to be a typo and a misspelling of the word Apache. But as it turns out, everything works now. So with Chef, one of the things that we can do is we can use testing to test drive all of our changes across our infrastructure. We can test them before we run them in production. And now that I've done that, I can actually go back up here. And I can run Chef Client. And I can give the chef client a recipe of Apache and say, now apply this new Apache recipe to yourself. So I'm running this locally. And then if I go back to my browser here as soon as this is done, port 80 won't work. But if I pull up port 81, it will work successfully. So of course, I refresh this page. And wah, 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 no good. But if I switch over here to port 81, now I have my thing running. 
So I've just used in tests to drive through uh, changing my policy with confidence. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a bunch of slides because we are now out of time. Uh, see, we're out of time. So what I need to do here really quickly, you're welcome to leave at any time. If that wasn't, oh, that stupid thing. I don't know how to PowerPoint very well either. I can't type or PowerPoint. Let's see if this does it. All right, good, so we can wrap up. So uh, we scratched the surface on this diagram. We hardly touched anything on here, but we did touch some stuff that I hope was interesting. With Chef, you can build anything, build anything that you like. You can manage it simply, and that's it. Now we're truly out of time. Thank you so much for coming.